The female lead tells women's stories. Remarkable, diverse, inspiring. An educational charity promoting positive female role models who show the many different routes to success and fulfillment. So often I hear people saying, oh, how do I get started? How do I do this? How do you do it? You just start. You have to begin. And it won't be perfect and it'll be messy and it'll be hard, but you're doing something and you're on your way. Empowering future generations of women through films and a book of 60 women donated to 18,000 schools in the UK and USA, reaching millions of young people. And through our female lead societies, we help girls to discover new role models that speak to their passions, ambitions and careers. Through our research into social media and mental health, we found a solution to the negative impact of social media on teen girls. Through a simple intervention, which encouraged girls to follow different influences, we were able to change their entire social media experience and sense of well-being. We called this campaign Disrupt Your Feed, and it reached 20 million people on social, with 330 million impressions all over the globe. So what's next? As well as inspiring girls, we're now finding ways to measurably improve the lives of older women through data, research, and the stories of those who have overcome challenges and found their own personal versions of success. We're a long way from being finished. Join us in our mission. Are we gonna talk about women's rights again? Yes, we're gonna talk about it until there's balance. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to our LinkedIn Lives. Uh, tonight we are going to be uh, understanding the vitally important question, why emotional intelligence is the key to your success. And helping us navigate that important question is Nada Nazadine. Hello, Nada. Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you, Edwina. It's such an honor to be here and I'm so thrilled to talk about EQ today. Brilliant. Well, a few words of introduction. So I'm Edwina Dunn. I'm the founder of The Female Lead, which is a charity showcasing amazing, diverse women who are shaping the world today. Uh, Nada is the founder and CEO of Rise Up For You. She's a coach, mentor, and she has 10 years experience as college professor and of an educational organization. So you are a, an educationalist at heart, Nada, which is music to my ears. You're also a singer, I hear. I read that. <laughs> and Lebanese by birth. And your book tells a very powerful human story, which is, is touching and uplifting. Um, so I have two quotes that I love of yours, which I'm going to say, and then we're going to talk. So I love this one. We all have blind spots. We don't know what we don't know. Oh, it's my favorite one. I used to use it in my business all the time with data. You don't know what you don't know. It's very powerful. And the second one, uh, the greatest tragedy is wasted human potential. Don't let that be your story. Yeah. Beautifully said. We'll come back to that. So um, I get to ask the first few questions and then I'm going to open it up to our to our very big audience, a very engaged audience. Um, and so do please send in those questions and we'll come to them towards the end. Great. So let's start. Let's start. So so we've all been told to value IQ. We're taught that in schools and universities. Yeah. Um, where does EQ or EI fit in, Nada? 
That's such a great question. And as an educator for many, many years, one of the first careers I've stepped into after singing, which you, which you see, um, that's always been a question for me. And it's always something that I've really tried to infuse as an educator is the EQ or the EI. So just so you know, um, if, you know, if you're listening, EQ and EI are the same thing. So EQ means emotional quotient, EI is emotional intelligence. They both have the same meaning, but um, it, it needs to fit in. And I'm a big advocate for having all education curriculum around the world start infusing emotional intelligence as a core curriculum. Because, you know, we always say it even today, and Edwina, I love that you're about research and data because that's so important, right? The research and the data is showing that the IQ, which is our technical skill, it might get our foot in the door. It might get us the interview. It's going to look good on our resume, but it's the emotional intelligence that's going to help you create sustainable success. And I think that's what everyone is looking for is sustainability. It's the ability to continuously build and be the best version of yourself. And it's the emotional intelligence that's going to help us do that. So why is emotional intelligence so important? What does it contribute? Let's focus on business first, yes. because I think it's more than that, but let's perhaps start with business. Absolutely, so emotional intelligence is huge. And one of the challenges that I'm seeing today is that it's actually underrated. It's very surfacy in what we're hearing online. And when people talk about it, they're not really getting to the core of what emotional intelligence is. So as an audience, we're really missing how crucial and important it is to the workspace, for our communities, really individually as well, right? So I will tell you that in businesses, for example, we work a lot with companies. The challenges that they have all stem with EQ and emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence, Edwina, if you don't mind if I go into this and then you can stop me at any time, mm -hmm. it's comprised of four pillars, okay? That self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. But many people don't know that those four pillars have another 18 competencies under them that make up every challenge that we see today when it comes to human behavior and people. Diversity, equity, and inclusion falls under EQ, unconscious bias, communication, generational differences, empathy, confidence in the career, internal motivation. All these challenges that we have, leadership, conflict resolution, are all competencies under EQ. So that's why I could talk about EQ for a week because there's so much there. So, and, and the founders of EQ were very strategic. And then the first two pillars have to do with the self, self-awareness, the second one, self-management. And then the third and the fourth have to do with you and others. But notice that they're the latter. So that's now social awareness, right? Empathy, and then all things leadership, which is the last pillar. And they're very strategic in putting leadership, right? And team building and empathy towards the end because they understand that the self has to be worked on first. So those are four pillars. And again, under that is another 18 competencies that I can also dive into. Mm. It's amazing, isn't it? It's such a rich area. You know, when I was really young, I, you know, when I was starting work, I was told some very basic things like you should try and use your senses in the proportion that you have them. And a very simple one was you have two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. And so you should listen more, watch more, and speak less. Mm. And that this kind of is the right balance for how you approach. Because communication, I'm assuming, is a vital point of the skills you develop in EI. Communication is a huge one. I will tell you that one of the most important ones, when people ask me, like, what's the first step for emotional intelligence? It's actually accurate self-assessment, which goes back to the blind spots that we talk about, Edwina, that, that you talk about and that I talk about in the book. And accurate self-assessment is a part of the first pillar. It's one of those competencies that falls under the first pillar. And another competency is self-confidence. So when you say the quote that I mentioned that the greatest tragedy is wasted human potential, it comes down to self-confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Imposter syndrome, making the ask, not feeling enough, perfectionist mindset, it all fa falls under that first pillar. But the, the real challenge is, is that no one's going to do the work unless they recognize they need the work. 
So I always say the hardest thing about change is realizing that we need it, right? Because it's very simple for us to say, you need emotional intelligence and you need emotional intelligence and you need to communicate better, but without being able to look at ourselves and say, maybe I, maybe I need this too. So specifically, let me give you an example in the workspace. When I, I was an executive at 27 years old, Edwina, okay? So I was quite young and I had 200 team members under me. PhDs, master's degrees, many of them were double my age. I was only 27. And I had an open door policy and as an executive. And I always said, please, like, come in. Any questions you have, any challenges you have, you know, as a team member, let me help you as an executive solve them. Well, it was crickets. Nobody would come in. <laughs> Nobody would come in the door. And I kept wondering, why is, no, why is no team member coming to talk with me as an executive? Well, then I started to hear that I was intimidating. And I kept saying, no, I'm not intimidating. You got to, that's you. You got to deal with that. That's your confidence, not me. And then another person said, you're intimidating. And then another person said, you're intimidating. So then I realized that I might have a blind spot. Maybe my assessment of myself isn't true. Okay. And if I don't believe it, I'm not going to change it. Right. So then I did an assessment that was anonymous with all 200 staff members as an executive. I was the only executive that did the anonymous assessment. And 75% of the team put that I was intimidating and unapproachable. I wasn't approachable. So now I was able to see that's clearly a blind spot for me that I didn't think was true. Now I can change. Well, before, if I don't know what exists, how can I change? So this is the challenge that we're seeing in the workspace, really in the homes and the community, is how many of us have a leader or maybe a team member that's causing disruption and they can't see it. They don't even know that they're doing it. Or maybe a leader doesn't want to change or they're not, they don't think they need to change. Maybe they think it's the team that's the problem. And we as an outsider can recognize there's blind spots there. So this is really the first step of starting. So it kind of begs the question, if you have a boss that has blind spots and you as a whole team are kind of held back because of not being able to approach this person or suggest ideas, what do you do? That's a great question. So this is where pillar three and four come in, which is the emotional intelligence of being able to adjust for different people. Okay. So I've been with leaders that are really hard to work with as well. And the very first thing I have to do is remember that they're a human being. That's the first thing. Sometimes we put our leaders on a pedestal and we have these expectations of them. In some cases we should because they're the leader, right? They're in that position. But we have to remember that leaders are also human and they're people and they have their own flaws, right? So I always say that leadership is a mindset. It's not a title. So now what would you do as a team member if you were able to build that relationship with that leader so that you now can go into a meeting with the leader and express yourself openly so that you now can say, hey, I know you're the boss. I know you're leading the team, but I just want to let you know how we're feeling so that we can all come together. I can guarantee that most leaders will hear you and respect you for speaking up. I've worked with the CEO before that was really, really tough and created a lot of toxicity in the workspace. And I cannot tell you, I knocked on the door, I walked in and I said, I know you're the boss. I know you're the leader. I respect you, but I want to let you know that there's some challenges that are happening and I want to share them with you so that we can all be better and grow. And I've never had a leader tell me, get out of my office and fire me. In fact, our relationship got stronger because they felt like there was a team member that also had their back that they were willing to come and talk with them opposed to talk about the leader, you know what I mean? Create toxicity, resign from the company, go somewhere else, right? And so I can tell you as a leader, as someone that runs my own company and I have a small team, when a team member comes to me and says, Netta, I don't know if you realize the energy that you're permeating or that's not clear communication, I say, thank you for telling me because I'd rather you tell me than just quit or leave or do something else. So I love that. And I, I love that in the book, and I've marked it because <laughs> I just thought it was fantastic. There's this little chart that you have. So it's a beautiful book. With Thank you. you. I'm wearing the same shirt. But this 
is is such a great way of thinking about ourselves, isn't it? You know, you have these different dimensions and you have this sort of self-realization, self-awareness that you talk about, which is how are you doing on each of these? I mean, I'm really interested in this because this is part of our thinking at the female lead too. Yes. Yeah. And and you say it beautifully in the video. It's redefining success for you, right? There's a lot of consumption out there, Edwina. Like even now with COVID-19 and everything that's happening around the world um, with racial injustice and the challenges and financial stress, there's so much information that's coming at us with social media and TV that we've lost who we are and what we really want. So now success is what we're told. This is success. This is what we need. And and today we're seeing it, right? It's a tragedy amongst humans that we're lost. We're, we're not able to find our ground so that we can be successful in the workspace. And that's because we have to get back to what does success mean to us? And the six pillars that you refer in the book, the happiest countries in the world. So again, I, I love research. And I went and I studied, you know, who are the happiest people? who are the happiest countries, right? And we find that the Scandinavian region, I know that there's a lot of people from Sweden on here as well. <laughs> so they're probably excited that I'm gonna talk about this, but the Scandinavian region for the past six years on the World Happiness Report, they have been at the top in regards to happiness, right? Because of their ecosystem. And when we dive even further into the research as to why, it's because of these pillars. It's because they're nurturing all aspects of life, not just the career. Okay, and I know specifically here in America, we've got caught in the race of 90% career, work, 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 make money, work, 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 that all the essentials that help us build fulfillment, that help us build emotional intelligence and kindness and empathy are put on the back burner. So we're talking self-worth and confidence, the top pillar. Without that, you have nothing. Because I always say it doesn't matter how many degrees you have, how many PhDs, how many masters, how many certifications, what technical skill you have, it doesn't matter. If you don't have the confidence and the self-worth to execute, all that education is gonna sit on the shelf. So that's the number one pillar. The second pillar is your career. Do you have meaning? Do you feel fulfilled? Do you get excited to wake up in the morning? Are you adding value and putting your best foot forward? The third, which is always the most interesting for people, is romance. And the reason why it's in there is because research has shown that chemically, romance, dating, marriages, it creates different behaviors in us, right? We have a different connection. So if that's not going well, right, a divorce, marriage, dating, breakups, that indirectly affects how we show up with our behaviors and someone sometimes we don't recognize. The fourth pillar is health. So not only nutritional health, not only physical health, but mental health, which we all have, stress management. So if you don't have your health, you don't have wealth, right? It's going to be hard to accumulate if you're not able to function as an individual. The fifth is people intelligence, which is what we're talking about here. So building relationships, fostering kindness. What are your, what are your relationships like with people in the workspace? What are they like in the community, right? Who are the people that are around you? What's your tribe per se? And then the last is money. And that means financial peace, financial future, being able to manage your money. Because we find that these are the top stressors that directly affect our EQ and how we behave with other people. I really, really like that. And of course, fulfillment is different to so many definitions of success, which yes. tend to be about power and money. And yes. fulfillment is something much richer. And as you say, much more, um, you know, the entirety of our being and not just one dimension. Yes. Fulfillment and meaning is meaning. what I talk about. And and I don't talk about purpose because for me, that, that term, it doesn't hold weight to it. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. I've had professionals come to me and say, I don't have purpose in my life. What do I live for? And I say to them, don't you have four kids? And they say, yeah. And I say, you don't think there's purpose there? So yeah. purpose to me is a very overrated term. And I think too many people are trying to find purpose. It's not about purpose. It's about meaning and fulfillment. Because I can argue that somebody can be on my team and say, I don't have purpose here. And I can say as the CEO, 
you have purpose. There's a lot of purpose. That's why you have a job. That's why I have you on my team. But maybe there's not meaning for you in this job. Maybe you don't feel fulfilled. That's really the core of it. Mm -hmm. So how do we rebuild our sense of self-worth? Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, we can go for long on that. So here's the first thing that I would do, and this ties into emotional intelligence, because I'm sure a lot of people watching as well are wondering, where do I start with EQ? And I can send this um, to you, Edwina, as well. So we actually say get feedback. Start by getting feedback, because again, you don't know what you don't know. So like we have a 24 point assessment. OK, and again, I can send this to you and your participants that you fill out. You rate yourself one through ten. Where am I on these 24 competencies that have to do with confidence and emotional and social intelligence? And then you take that set, that same assessment and you give it to five to seven other more people that work with you, that are around you, and you see what they gave you. And now you can compare and take a look. You'll be able to see where are some of my strengths and where are some of my weaknesses. So you'll see, and we see this a lot with professionals, that they underscore on confidence, right? So they might give themselves like a three on confidence, but all of the individuals that assessed them gave them a nine or an eight. So that means that the way that they see themselves is very underrated than what other people see themselves. Now they know that that's a, that's a weakness that they need to work on. And then we also see people give themselves a nine or a 10 on leadership, and then their scores come back and they get a five. <laughs> their average is a 5.5 or a six. So now I can clearly see my blind spot. I think. Oh, I thought I was better at being a leader, but it looks like maybe there's some areas that I need to work on. And now we can start that work. Now we can see leadership, empathy, internal motivation. Okay, my scores are under what I thought they were going to be. Now let's work on them. So the first thing that I say about self-worth, going back to that pillar, is having a real conversation with yourself. I call it reverse engineering. So everybody do this with me. Anybody that's watching, if you have a piece of paper or a pen or a pencil next to you, take out your notebook, draw a line straight down the notepad. On one side, I want you to put the belief or a doubt that's hindering your success today. Just put one. We might have more than one, but just put one for right now. So any belief or doubt that you believe is hindering your success. So I've heard some individuals say, I don't deserve to be where I'm at imposter syndrome, right? I, I have this promotion. I have this role. I, I'm an executive, but I don't think I deserve to be there. Okay. So that's a belief that's getting in the way of, of you moving forward, right? Or I'm not a good speaker. So I've been put in this role to present. I'm a manager, but I'm not, I don't do well with speaking. That's another belief, right? That's hindering you. So anything right now that's hindering your success, put that one down. And then on the other side, I want you to put, I remember when. And now I want you to reverse engineer. When is the first time you felt that feeling? Where did it come from? What was the situation? How did it make you feel? Right? Really retracing because so many of us, we're behaving and we're doing things in the professional space and in our personal life. And we forget where they came from because maybe it was so long ago. So now it's subconscious. And now that's what we call the trigger. This is where EQ comes in. We're triggered by something and we don't know why. We just, we feel it and our body reacts. But our beliefs are always tied to an emotion. It's tied to a feeling. And what we need to do is reverse the thought to get it back to the feeling. So now we can rewrite the feeling. Right. And this is the neuroscience and the brain plasticity that we're able to change. Right. Neuroscientists have told us that if you have negative thoughts or if you have triggers or beliefs that are getting in your way, we can rewrite them to be positive and then we can start to change the behavior around it. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. I love it. I felt like I've just been in a a masterclass for a few Good. minutes. It's a very powerful. Now, listen, um, everybody out there, your questions, please. I'm going to ask you one thing. Give them just two minutes sure. to put their questions sure. together. Um, what should we talk about? I mean, you know what I love is you say, as in part of your book, 
you know, life's too short to blame other people and be miserable. Rise up and live a happy life. It's such a, a rallying cry and it's so big. Yeah. Did you write the whole book and then come up with that or was that the beginning? It's a good question. Um, it kind of just happened, right? The first two chapters are more personal and story and I, and I know you've read it, Edwina. But then as I was writing the book, it just started to flow. It just started to flow. But I, that is a mantra for me. You know, life is, life is too short to blame other people. We are in control of our circumstance, okay? We might not be in control of life that happens to us, right? And, and I wanna make this really clear, is every single human being is hit by life, positive and negative. Life is the one thing that doesn't discriminate. Okay, you can be the best human being, you can walk a straight path and be so kind, but that doesn't mean that you're not gonna have death. That doesn't mean you're not gonna have heartbreak. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna lose your job. That doesn't mean that you're not possibly gonna lose all your money or be furloughed because you were hit by COVID-19, right? So life is inevitable, it happens to us all. So we have the power to say, okay, this just happened to me, now what? How do I rise above that? And there's too many people, and that's why I say that the greatest tragedy is wasted human potential. There's too many people that are saying, well, I just lost my job, so I can't A, B, C, and D. Or when I was a kid, this happened to me, and that's why I can't hold the relationship. Stop giving your way all your power. Recognize that use your pain as fuel for growth. That's the best way I can say it, is recognize that we have this pain and then say, all right, this is what happened to me, acknowledge it, don't ignore it, acknowledge it. These are the struggles that I've gone through. Now, how can I take this and be a better ber version of myself with that? And I know you say that having gone through some big things yourself, which we yeah. won't talk about now, but there are beautiful- I'll come back on. I'll come another back. time, another time. <laughs> now, let's do some questions. Here we are, Jocelyn. Could you please share the self effect? Oh yeah, we're, we're gonna share it with you after this, Jocelyn. So um, Nada's very kindly said she's got these nuggets of sheer brilliance that she's going to give us so that you can, Lauren will make that available um, after this broadcast. So thank you, Nada. Okay, here's another question. What if you can't retrace and reverse engineer? Yeah, very good question. So everybody is a little bit different. So some people know exactly where a belief comes from, okay? Some people, it takes them a month or two. I've actually had clients that they can't figure it out, they can't figure it out, and then they wake up and they say, ah, I remember. And that's because sometimes the experiences that we go through are either too small, so we don't, we don't realize that they've impacted us, or they're so deep that we forgot about it. We want to forget about it. And so when we try to reverse engineer, it might not come right away. And so the best thing that you can do is keep writing down that belief and then just take it back one part at a time. So for example, did I feel this way in my last job? No, I didn't. Okay, that means that something between my last job and this job is triggering me. What is that? Or maybe I did feel this in my last job. Did you feel it in the job before? Yes. Okay. Did you feel it when you were in college? No. Okay. So that's what I mean by sometimes you have to really break it out and see when did I start feeling this way? When did this belief happen to me? So I can reverse engineer myself. I, I coach myself as well. And I can see that some of the challenges and the beliefs that I have, they stem back from when I was 27. And when I was leading, right? And some things that were told that I had to, they don't go back to my childhood. My childhood is a lot of positive enforcement, which I'm very blessed to have, right? So I can, when people say to me, how do you have confidence? Where does your confidence come from? I can reverse engineer that back too. I say, it goes all the way back to my childhood. It goes back to when my mom used to drive us to school. My brothers and I were in the back seat. And she would say, today, you're going to be amazing. And we would say, today, we're going to be amazing. Today, you're going to get good grades and get the best education. Today, I'm going to get good grades. And we would just 
say it. And she like ingrained these beliefs in us. So when I got older and somebody said, you're not good enough, I said, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> so I, I was able to reverse that. So short answer is sometimes it's going to take you a couple weeks or a month and just be patient with the process. Sounds good. Sounds good. Georgina, what tactics can be used to survive and thrive Ooh, in a blame culture? Mm, painful. Very painful. Um, <laughs> two, two parts to that. Continuing to make yourself better. OK, even when that's around you, do the best that you can. Surround yourself by positive enforcement. And second is transparency. So this is, again, where it comes back to being able to transparently say some of these challenges that are happening in the workforce, they're not healthy for us as a team. How do we overcome them? We have to be able to do that. And that really is the hardest part about the workplace is that a lot of people can feel when something's not working. A lot of people feel negativity or there's an energy or there's a feeling that's not productive, but we don't say anything. And this goes back to that first pillar of confidence and being able to speak up with emotional intelligence. So anytime we, and specifically in the workspace, anytime we're going to address a challenge, we need to bring solutions. Okay. So there's a lot of blaming that's happening. What are some things that we could do to prevent that? Who is the person that you're the closest to Georgina that you can have this conversation with, right? How do we create more positive reinforcement to shift that culture? These are the conversations that happen. If you remember anything from today, it's speaking up with confidence and EQ. That's the only way we can make a shift or a change. How can we smoothly introduce EQ to the workplace so that everyone can learn and practice it for better job satisfaction and performance? Whoa, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's my dream world. Yeah, mine too. Wow. <laughs> I'm always thrilled when a company comes to us and says, can you teach EQ to the team? I say, absolutely. Yes, I can. So again, the first thing is really starting it with yourself because then it allows people, it's, people see change in you. So when you start to build emotional and social intelligence and then you start to move up in your career or you start to have thriving relationships, people will notice what are you what are you doing? And you can say, I'm going through EQ. I'm practicing emotional and social intelligence. I'm taking a course. I'm doing a training. Then the next best thing that we can do is try to influence our HR team, our executives, our managers to also understand EQ so that they can bring it in. Because again, what we need to do is create that buy-in. And right now, as I mentioned earlier, Edwina, is that emotional intelligence is talked on a very surfacey level. Mm -hmm. So we really don't understand how pivotal it is to workplace and the challenges that we see today. When we educate, and that's why I love educating, because the more I educate on EQ, the more people go, aha, okay, this is where we need to start, right? Same conversation with diversity, equity, and inclusion. When people ask me, can you do diversity, equity, and inclusion training? I say, not without EQ, not without EQ, because DEI is stemmed from programming and beliefs and unconscious bias from people. And if we're going to get here, we got to start here. So it's that education that's very, very important. So all of you that are listening, urge your leaders, help influence them positively to bring emotional intelligence into the workspace. Wonderful. And probably the last question here, but from Ella, empathy is key to EQ, but it doesn't come naturally to me. What would you recommend? Ella, I'm with you on that one. That's the hardest competency for me when I was younger as well. So the key, the key question that I'm going to ask you that you need to figure out for yourself as well is why? Why is empathy hard for you? Is it because you have judgment? towards certain situations and experiences. So I know for me, that was something I really had to break down and I'm being transparent. And was when I was younger, you know, my dad came from a third world country. So for me, complaining and, and just all that empathy didn't work for me. I was like, figure it out. <laughs> You're not getting any empathy from me, just figure it out. And I had to understand that that does not, that doesn't work. And so I really had to know why do I have trouble with being able to put myself in other people's shoes, because that's what empathy is. Why do I have trouble understanding other people? 
And that's because I had my own ego and judgment about their situations that was getting in the way. When somebody came to me and said, hey, I'm struggling with being motivated and I don't know how to get a B or how to get a C, I'm getting Fs. My response is you gotta figure it out. Get over it and figure it out. That was my old response, not today. I wouldn't be in the career that I had if that was today. I had to understand that. And so the more you can break down why you're not empathetic, now we can start to pull the what I call the ego away. I always say that ego gets in the way of empathy. So we have to understand why do you have trouble with that? Hmm. That could be some, that could be why we all love the New Zealand Prime Minister so much, isn't it? Lack of <laughs> ego. Yeah. Lots of empathy, lack of ego. I mean, <laughs> wonderful advice. Listen, everybody. I mean, I could talk to Nada all evening. I you have been energetic, charismatic, and Thank utterly you. brilliant. Thank you so much. She has also mentioned to us that for any of you out there who would like to sign up for her uh, leadership conference next week. Um, she's offering a fabulous discount and we will put those details online for all of you um, if you wish to, to, to take that up and who wouldn't learn something from that. It's a really generous offer, thank you. So, um, so really all that's left for me to do is mention um, that next week our LinkedIn Live is on the 3rd of November. It's on a Tuesday, slightly different. And it's with South African Niven Posma. And we're going to talk about office politics, that lovely, juicy negative that we all, well, experience at some stage and hate so much. But anyway, we look forward to that. So until then... Nada, you've been an absolute joy. Thank you. And thank everybody out there for joining us tonight. It's It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Edwina.